Hello and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's brilliant as always to be here with you. The iconic Paul Bindig is here with me as always. How are you, Paul? I'm, I'm feeling great, and now I've been called iconic, so... Uh... That's completely not true, but it makes me feel That's really right. good. So thrilled to be and here, And I think David. icons is an appropriate term uh, in, in conjunction with this podcast. So I'm, I'm going to make a bit of an analogy, Paul. I, I used to listen to the WTF podcast, which is Mark Maron's podcast. It's one of the world's biggest podcasts. He interviews fascinating people. And I remember when he scored the Barack Obama gig where... He, he did his intro saying, I'm so nervous here. There's secret service around everywhere. Um, it's, my whole life's been turned upside down for 24 hours, but here comes Barack Obama. Now, it's not quite the same, but in music terms, I'd argue that Mike Garson is up there as a former president of the United States of music. <laughs> so that's my, that's my <laughs> strangled analogy. So we're, Paul and I have just finished two hours of amazing chat with Mike um, as you'll hear in this first of two parts, Mike gives some amazing insights on his work with David Bowie. Part two will definitely cover uh, everything outside of Bowie and, and some amazing stuff uh, in surprise for you there as well. But this part one, Paul, it, it alone is something that probably should go to universities. Oh, look, I, I couldn't agree more, David. And and. I will always say we've never had a bad guest on this podcast. We've been so lucky. I always talk about keyboard players being humble guys and gals, generous with their time and their thoughts. But I've got to tell you, this is something out of the box, this interview, and nothing to do with David and I. It's all because of Mike and his generosity of thought, spirit and time. And he's a, he's a true educator you know he loves to teach and that just comes across in the way he tells his anecdotes and his stories and and like david i won't give away some of the very cool surprises that are in both halves of this podcast but it is it was a like i'm i'm still a bit on a bit of a high from because we've only just finished recording it and it was such yeah, fun absolutely so now here, here we go with with part one we hope you enjoyed a lot and we'll talk to you at the end of the show Mike, it's an absolute honour to have you here with us. Can't thank you enough for taking the time. So I think we're in for a fun chat. Well, you know, I listened to a bunch of uh, your interviews with some great players and talented people, so I get the feel of the format, and I liked it a lot. And as you know, I get a lot of calls for interviews and podcasts. You could only choose so many, but... I'm so close to the world of keyboards and piano that how could one turn that down? Uh, thank you. And, you. and you sure are close to the world of keyboards and um, we've got lots to talk about in that, that regard. So I th um, for our listeners, we're going to cover this sort of in three parts, but I thought we'd talk about the early years. Mike, I know you started very, very young playing. Uh, do you want to give us a synopsis of your childhood and how wonderfully you were introduced to music? So... It seemed like at the time, seven years old was very young, right? But as I've grown older, some of the people who play better than me started at five or three. So there must be something that goes, Mozart included, <laughs> there must be something about the cellular memory and how the brain absorbs so much data, even though they might not have the maturity of an older person the absorption rate and and the fingers and the cellular memory. So with that said, I'm not complaining too much. I still been playing 70 years. So because I'm 77 and I started when I was seven, you know, in 1952 in Brooklyn. And most piano homes had pianos. Well, most homes had pianos, what I'm saying. And uh, my mom played, my dad played, my sister played. So the peer pressure was pretty rough, you know. So <laughs> I started playing. The very humorous thing was in those days, for some strange reason, the telephone was in the closet in the near the living room. And I'd sit at the piano, and I wouldn't practice a lot because I was lazy. So my mom would make believe she's running inside the closet to call the piano teacher to cancel my lessons every time I didn't do at least a half hour or an hour. And this went on 
for years until I became uh, responsible enough to keep it going for myself without the having to be told to practice you know that's amazing and, and so mike how did you go from that that initial practice to actually deciding i do enjoy doing this and start playing um, out and about my my first gig was 14 i played a sweet 16 made five dollars i played it with dave liebman the great tenor sax player who we grew up together and he worked with miles davis when i went with david bowie he went with miles davis which is pretty fascinating because Miles Davis to me is the equivalent of Bowie in the jazz world in terms of moving on and moving forward and that kind of a thing. So uh, I started playing gigs at 14 and a lot of weddings and bar mitzvahs and <clears throat> the dance gigs, the normal things that musicians do. And uh, But when I went off to school, I was going to be a doctor, so I was pre-med student. But um, the music the pull was too great. So uh, I had talked to my uh, science teacher. I had just gotten an F on dissecting a pig. And I think I made like spare ribs and chopped liver from this horrible situation with this fetal pig. And I said, come, come here. And I took him over to the window and I said, see that building over there? That's the music building. This was at Brooklyn College. I said, would you mind... If I get out of your hair, take that failure, the F, and make it a D. And he said, yeah, get the fuck out of here. Goodbye. And it was all music from there on out. <laughs> so I assume you don't regret the, the non-medical career, Mike. I can't imagine you would. You know, I have more doctor friends these days than I do musician friends. Uh, a lot of the doctors, their family and themselves, they play music. And I, I have actually composed, we'll talk more about it later, Symphonic Healing Suite in 2014 that I work with a very uh, famous uh, brain surgeon on the project. And we tested the music out on, uh, she just about 100 patients and we chose the, the piece based on that. And uh, he's an amazing uh, brain surgeon. His name is Dr. Duma. But the funniest thing is, he played piano when he was a kid. So he told me he wanted to be me, and he just considers himself a glorified plumber. And I'm thinking, you're saving lives, and, you know, maybe I get people laughing or smiling or enjoying my music, but I, I wouldn't go that far. But that's how much he loves the piano. So we, we, we met uh, on some great territory and made some nice music, but I'll tell you yeah, all about that. Yeah, later. very keen to talk on that. So that's great. And so, uh, Mike, your first um, audition for for David Bowie. I've had the privilege of researching for this show, and and I know there's a very it was nearly like destiny. Your your the merging of your jazz playing up until an early age, and then meeting David Bowie and auditioning. Can you tell us about the day before your audition with Bowie? Uh, and how you were feeling about music, and then what happened the very next day. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there's a couple of aspects to this. This is the part that connects with when you said, is there a question never been asked me? And it's connected to this <clears throat> in that when I auditioned, which I'll talk about in a minute, I had no problem playing the music. Let's put it that way. It was quite easy for me. It was a song called Changes. But what never gets asked, because everyone always talks about the Latin Sane album and uh, the title track and Lady Grinning Stolen Time, and of course we'll explore all that. But no one has asked, why, what did you do to get to that gig? In other words, there were a series of steps, aside from what happened the day before, that if I hadn't done those steps, I could be the nicest guy in the world if David Bowie would not have hired me. So it was based on a skill, a few skill sets that I had that the rock guys didn't have. That this guy named David Bowie, being the ultimate casting director, could see, oh, that's the whipped cream on the cake. We'll be that infrastructure with the solid drums and bass and Mick Ronson, who's an unsung hero genius. But we'll put this thing on top 
And that's going to be very cool. And it changed a lot of the trajectory of, of where he went from there. I was young. I didn't know any of that at the time. I just was playing the piano. But in hindsight, I got to see their decisions were very smart because it hadn't been done before exactly like that. So basically, I was playing jazz gigs uh, to answer that question. And, and, and in New York City, to, to be in a jazz club when you studied jazz through the 60s and to be able to get to a club in the late 60s and 70s, it's a dream come true. However, I got married and I had a daughter at the time who was one year old. She's like much older now. And, and I did this jazz gig with Dave Liebman and Steve, it was either Eddie Gomez on bass or Steve Swallows, I can't remember, a drummer named Pete LaRocca, who was a fantastic jazz drummer. And it's in a club on 69th Street and Broadway. Five people in the club, and I made $5. I came home to my wife, and I said, I did all this practicing, eight hours a day for these last so many years, and this is what I get. It doesn't make sense. And... You know, there's that old expression, careful what you wish for. And I said, I think I should go out with a rock band. But it was a little tongue-in-cheek, you know. And then within a day or two, the phone rings. And it's David Bowie. And uh, I didn't know who he was. And I'm given a piano lesson in my house. My wife is working in Manhattan. I'm in Brooklyn. I have a brand-new student. I'm sitting at the piano here, right next to me, my daughter was one year old, she's in a swing going back and forth, and I would keep pushing the swing, and trying to teach the lesson, and I'm being asked to come to RCA studio in Manhattan, and audition for someone who I don't know who he is, but it was intriguing, that's all I could say, it was intriguing, so I asked the piano student if he would babysit <laughs> my daughter, who my wife to this day says she still wants to cut my balls off because it's like I it was the first time student. <laughs> I didn't know him. Kidnapping Brooklyn, you know, it was a rough town. <laughs> so I zoomed down to RCA 20 minutes from Brooklyn. And I walk in there and there's these guys in spectacular clothing, all with a different color hair and boots like that high, and this is like in the middle of the week, and I don't know where the fuck I was. This is like, this doesn't make any sense. And I'm in a t-shirt and jeans, you know, and this handsome guy, which was Mick Ronson, with silver hair and different colors through it, and dressed also beautifully, sitting at the piano and waves me over. Bowie and the Spiders are hanging in the control room. So it was the old days with the studio it was separated with the glass. They could see it all, but in the center of the room, beautiful piano. And I shook uh, hands with Mick and he shows me the, the chords of changes. And he said, can you play this? And I'm going to show you exactly what I played. Okay. said you got the gig I said that's the fastest audition in my life and that was my audition uh, with that song and in 2006 the last show David Boehm did was with me and him and Alicia Keys for a benefit I think it was an AIDS benefit and we played Changes so I closed out 40 some odd years later with changes and it was my audition song. That's that's amazing. It's uh, like it's like a full circle, like a like a bookend. What, what, what an amazing story. Um, so, so I'm interested, Mike, in I believe David Bowie was famously quoted once in saying, Mike Garson is the best rock piano player in the world because he's not a rock piano player. 
um, and you and you, you mentioned yourself uh, that you know your, your background was jazz and avant garde, real cutting edge stuff. I'm interested in what it was like f- for you as a as a piano player to adjust to a band like the Spiders, a, a British rock band, and how that came together in the studio and live when you were working with them. It was a little shocking, you know, because the English rock bands, their time feel is coming from another place. And I'm coming from very... From all that, and I'm supposed to be going... So I had to readjust a little bit. And I was a little bit of a jazz snob and a classical snob. So they were not helping me, my mindset, because I hadn't realized... uh, judge lest you not be judged or something like that (laughs) but it it did backfire on me but eventually I recognized these guys are great this way and what I was doing is great this way and Stravinsky's great this way and Beethoven's great this way and Keith Jarrett is great this way and Oscar Peterson is great that way and Brad Maldon is great this way on and on Herbie is great this way you know so I started playing with them And I felt like I was invading a little bit. Um, It was only a week from when I had the uh, audition. It was going to be a couple of weeks we were playing our first show in Cleveland, uh, Ohio. And uh, I walk into the rehearsal room. I'm sitting at the piano and I look over here and I see speakers this high. I'm coming from a jazz club without an amplifier, bass player, upright bass player, no amp, gutted strings for walking bass lines, you know, and, and upright piano out of tune playing with people like Elvin Jones who work with Coltrane and what have you. And, and, and I'm saying, excuse me, Mr. Bowie, I see that um, the PA system is facing in the wrong direction. The band got hysterical. I said, what's so funny? That's your monitor system. There's the PA, and they pointed to this fucking thing. It was like surrounding the room. And I said, oh, okay, I've arrived in the rock world. And I never looked back from that viewpoint. And I learned a lot about sound and things. I I like the sound to be right, you know, on jazz gigs now. And there's a higher... Jazz musicians always would, were about the quality of the improvisation, rightfully so. But the rock world was about the song and the vocals and the play, but the sounds, you know, Staley Dan, how, how you work on an album for six months or a year, you know. So the jazz guys didn't. I mean, I grew up listening to cassettes of Charlie Parker that would fly around under the screen in Brooklyn and you'd get a hold of Bud Powell and and. And you could hardly hear it. You think you heard had background noise a minute ago. You should have heard what this sound like. But that's what I studied from, you know. So it was a great opportunity to music should be played with good sound. Just like I not, I like a nice concert hall if I'm doing a, a classical or jazz performance. So um, so we started playing and and and. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered the question fully. Well, you did. You did answer it beautifully, and the, the question was really about how you were, you, know, you were being a jazz avant-garde player adjusted to the, the rock environment. And I, I think you, you, you've exactly answered it. Well, yeah, yeah, I wanted to say I wanted to say a little more because their time feel, uh, aside from feeling invasive, because they had their own vibe. They've been playing for two years together. I'm doing something else. I played a little far too far behind the beat. I had to tighten up my time. Uh, in those days, we weren't using click or metronome. Sly, Sly used it, but back in the seventies. But uh, Bowie wasn't. So the band there was some fluctuations. The drums rushed a little. This eventually we became a pretty tight unit. But it, it was shocking in that there was no real jazz essence, which you do hear in. Sting, for example, or this one or that one. This was English rock guys playing and Trevor on bass, just the roots and very, very, very basic, but tight and good. And Woody's drumming was excellent. And well, Mick's was, Mick Ronson was kind of a supernatural player in that, aside from a great guitar player, 
he he wrote great string parts. He wrote the string parts for Life on Mars. Uh, he wrote the string parts on a solo I played for David on an album called Pinups called See Emily Play. And at the end, it's this wild piano with these beautiful strings. That's Mick. And he played nice piano also, so which has helped me get that gig because he was able to appreciate the things that, that I did. And one of the things that I realized, not at the time, but afterwards, I think I played the piano how I thought David would have played the piano if he had the same skill level. He did play fun piano, and I enjoyed it. I think you hear him on Pretty Things or You Pretty Things on the Top of the Pops and that kind of stuff. Um, but um, it was very basic, but it had a vibe, you know. One thing about singer-songwriters their intention is strong when they play their piece. It might not be our Tatum, but it feels right. You know what I mean? I'm sure you get asked about this a lot, but if I don't ask you this, I'll, I'll probably get sacked from this uh, this keyboard podcast. So Aladdin Sane, the album is, as, as we record this, it's almost exactly 50 years since the release of that album. So it was released in April 1973 as we're doing the recording. And the... Aladdin Sane track itself, your your piano solo on that is a beautiful avant-garde, crazy, brave piece of, I think most keyboard players would say genius, and most Bowie fans would say genius. And as I said, I'm sure you get asked about this a lot, but I, I would love to, my understanding is that was completely improvised, so I'd love to get into inside your head a little bit as to the process you went through in arriving at that incredible solo, which is, um, I would say, rather unusual for a, a British rock band to be putting on their album. Again, the credit goes to David Bowie because it wasn't my first uh, thing that... It was a first take in that style, but my first playing, it was over like an A and a G. So I played stuff like... And he said, no, that's too mundane. And I thought, okay. So then, because it's an A and a G chord, I had played a lot of Latin music. You know how those things. So I did all that. He said, that's very good, but I'm looking for, he said, didn't you tell me you played on the avant-garde scene in New York and you played all this freaky music and you had your classical chops and you had your jazz chops? I said, you do not want that because... That's why I'm not working Saturday night. <laughs> he said, leave it to me. I know how to put the bass drum in four. And there's a beat. You can play anything over it. Just go for it. And then it was one take. So that's the general outline of what happened. And because I was given permission by an artist that I respected to do whatever I want, and unlike many directors that I've worked for when I've done films or other rock artists, or I won't mention the name, that micromanagement, do this, do that, play this chord, that fucking interferes with the music channeling through you and, and coming in. If, 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 if there's some truth that the music flows through us and someone jacking away, they're going to interfere with it. So David had a big vision. He said, just go for it. Well, with permission like that from a giant artist like that, I just went for it. And I've never played a better one. I've played the piece several times on the road with him and others, but I never got to that level. Because it's the zeitgeist of that time, tried in the studio, on the piano that Hey Jude was recorded on, Ken Scott producing it with David, great ears, did the Beatles, he knew sound, you knew how to EQ it. So there's infinite, it's just infinite amount of things that caused that to be what it was. And it's much bigger than me. And I never even heard the track for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. It was a studio date for me, you know? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I I, am I right in saying, Mike, it was, it was a Beckstein, it was the same one that uh, the, the Beatles used and... Um, uh, Queen and this sort of thing is that is that correct? Yeah, that was the Beckstein piano. Yeah, band. amazing, it's fantastic. You couldn't listen. You couldn't play a wrong note in that studio. The notes found you. 
you know, sometimes I have to find the notes. They found me. Yeah, it's a great perspective. And so, Mike, I mean, obviously, aside from you taking that different approach to playing, Bowie himself obviously changed his style over the years. So did, did you have to do much to actually adapt to his changing style? Or given how wide a brief you were given, it was just, you know, what you worked on at the time? Right before I met him, the prior, let's say, 10 years, maybe 15 years, I played for maybe 800 singers. Maybe 10 were great and maybe 700 were horrible, but I was making a living. When David came into the picture, he had phrasing like Frank Sinatra. He was he was a natural, and my accompanying for him, again, we were a, a duet co-creating music together. I wasn't the accompanist and the piano player. Of course, I am and was that, but he didn't treat me that way. I was part of his aura. And when we played, I could feel it in my fingers, the connection to him. In fact, when he was having a heart attack on tour on 2004 in Germany, my hands tightened up I, because I was telepathically connected to him. I could feel something was wrong. And thank God he got through that concert and they took him right to the hospital in Hamburg, Germany and fixed him up. And that was still, he got another 10 years of life after that. But I felt my fingers not responding well. So I knew something was wrong. So anyway, to answer that question, you know, he, his phrasing was so great. And I had so much experience. And I had played for the jazz singer, uh, Nancy Wilson already, uh, Mel Torme. I played for, um, I, I was fortunate because in New York, there was the Catskill Mountains. It's 110 miles above New York City. And they had 50, 100 hotels in a 20-mile radius. All these famous bands played there. And all the comedians, I backed up Jackie Mason. And all these great comedians and singers and some bad ones would come to these hotels. And I started out at dumpy hotels making $15 a week at 15 and then went to $40 and suddenly ended up like $180 in fancier hotels. And there would be great bands. I I, I played opposite with my trio. I played opposite uh, Eddie Palmieri, who's a great Latin pianist. We became friends. I gave him actually some jazz lessons back in the day, and he gave me some Montuno lessons. This so David Bowie... Uh, seemed to, like a forensic specialist of my brain, he seemed to be able to get in there and anything that I had practiced landed on one of his albums and song from a lady grinning soul That's like to Time, which is stride piano from the 20s. And that's probably a good segue, Mike. I know it's it's an impossible task given your career and, and still talking in David Bowie's sphere here, but let's try and cover some of the iconic keyboard motifs that you created or played a direct role in. Are there three that resonate with you most after all these years? So not so much about the fans, but what are the three that really still resonate with you to this day? Well, it would have to be Aladdin saying, you know... Uh... Would have to be that. Would have to be Lady Gritting Soul, right? And Time. But there were other ones later on on the outside album, Small Plot of Land, and I'm Deranged, and Architect Guys. And then there was uh, on the reality, I'm uh, Bring Me the Disco King, where I'm almost playing like Brubeck. And that was. 
the fifth time David recorded that song, every time it was with a band, he never was happy, he never released any of them. He said, let's just do it with piano and voice and a little drum loop. It was Matt Chamberlain. They took a little drum loop from an album called Heathen. They grabbed this little piece of drums that Matt played on, and they brought it over to the reality album. Tony Visconti made a little two-bar loop, and I just played against it. So I'm, I'm interested, Mike, in the process of, obviously you worked with, with David for, for, for decades, in the studio creating the music, but then also taking that out live so people could appreciate and enjoy it around the world. What was the process like of translating these amazing studio pieces into a live environment? Well, you know, the thing about David, he didn't feel that we had to play the album exact. And I was sort of the kind of loose cannon where even if the bass and drums and guitar were playing pretty much like the album track, I played it different every time. I mean, I must have done Life on Mars 200 different ways. <clears throat> There's a version from Paris in 1999. It's just fantastic. And I didn't even do the original one. It was Rick Wakeman, you know. But he never toured, so I, I, I played it different all the time. So he allowed that, and, and he wanted the band to continuously evolve. So depending on the length of the tour, these songs took on all sorts of things. He is aware enough to know that you need it to sound like the song that he recorded, but within that range. I mean, one day I had my synth on stage at Kurzweil, and in soundcheck, we're playing, we're, we're getting ready to play Let's Dance. And I start playing like an acoustic Spanish guitar on a stupid keyboard in the middle of the 90s that sounded horrible. And he said, oh, use that as the intro for the piece. We'll start the bridge on that and you play that. So there's one video, I think, from Glastonbury or somewhere where the cameras are on the guitar players because they didn't know it was me playing it off the keyboard. It was such a horrible sound, but he liked the vibe. And he's, his whole thing was feeling and emotion and the vibe. And that's one of the things I learned from him. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like it was a, an amazing environment and uh, a creative environment where you were encouraged to inject your own ideas and, and your own thoughts, which must have been very rewarding for you. Uh, with, with that in mind, I'm really interested in what the creative process was like working on albums. Were there any that were particularly challenging? And if so, why, why would that have been? I think he did his preliminary work um, really very well thought out. So when I got there, I mean, most of the albums I did in a couple of sessions. They might be in the studio a couple of weeks, a couple of months. I'd come in for a few days. Aladdin saying, I think I did it in three sessions. And um, there was never what the question implies, like difficult, never happened with him. I, I really think, look, I played with 13 bands with David, 13 different bands. And in the first two years, people don't know this, he had five bands from when I joined through Young Americans when I was the music director and Luther Vandross was in the band singing. He fired five bands in the first two years, except for me. Not because we were friends, but which we were, but because I could change styles with him. You can't picture the Spiders from Mars being able to play like soul music uh, on Young Americans and those kind of vibes. That was Dennis Davis and Willie Weeks and Andy Newmark and people of that kind of vibe, Carlos Alomar. So I was able to make those changes for Diamond Dogs, for pinups, for Young Americans. Uh, it, but anytime we went in the studio, Diamond Dogs was right after he had actually uh, fired the Spiders from Mars and ended that whole thing probably six months to a year and a half too soon for his fans maybe six months too soon for me uh but this is david bowie he, he was following his own beat and he knew he had to move on it was a little uncomfortable on certain tours towards the last two or three weeks when he'd be done with the tour in his mind and he'd be grouchy the last couple of weeks because he's already in the next project so we always had to make sure that 
tours long too long. But essentially, I did about 600 live shows with him and over 20 albums. It's pretty, considering you got to understand, what I left out at the beginning is I was only hired for eight weeks. Well, that's right. And I mean, 600 shows is amazing by any measure. And, and Mike, during those shows, are, are there some standout memories playing with all those musicians? Are there particularly gigs or venues that have really stood out for you? You have to say Glastonbury in 2000 because it was his return to Glastonbury from 1970, which was 30-year anniversary. And that's considered the best show ever at Glastonbury, at least that's what I hear. And right before us, I was watching from the side of the stage uh, um, Willie Nelson, (laughs) who was great. And, you know, so everyone was on this festival for two, three days. It was so people are on the farmlands there uh, and filthy and dirty. And we came on and just the lights went on in everybody's mind and it was a great show. There's a great DVD out on it. Probably could find it on YouTube and all that. And it was very humorous because, uh, David looked out into the audience. There was a quarter of a million people there and he got nervous and he said, go out and warm up the show for me. I said, what? He said, yeah, go play green sleeves. You know that song? going out. I'm the fucking guinea pig. He chooses me to see how fucked up it's going to be. I go out there and the keyboard doesn't work. So now I'm having a heart attack. There's 50 tech guys plugging every wire in in the universe and no piano sound. Then it dawned upon me. I shut the volume off in the rehearsal. I didn't shut the keyboard off, but I brought it down to zero. So had the band come out, and there was no piano sound on the... David would have absolutely had a breakdown because it featured piano. It was, I think, Wild as the Wind. There was a lot of piano. And they would have been looking at me what happened. So it was a blessing that he sent me out there for two or three minutes. I was dying, but that's okay. And then I played Green Sleeves and the band came out. So that was very memorable. Next memorable was Hammersmith. I'm only in the band a few months, and uh, he actually said, open the show for us, this is in 73, playing a medley of my songs, Streisand's in the audience, Barbara Streisand's in the audience, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Elliot Gould, actors, everybody's there, and you take Ziggy and Changes and John Amoni dancing and Life on Mars and make a medley. So I went out there and I did it. It was pretty nerve wracking, but it opened the show. See, he had that sense of a director and a producer, like this is the overture. That's right. (laughs) And I think you raise a great point there, Mike, about the theatricality of the performances, both on on record and, and live. So, I mean, what... How did you contribute to that aspect of the theatricality and visual aspect of the show? Because you're obviously a striking figure as a player. Um, you know, what, what was your take on the, the visual aspects? Well, first of all, it was brilliant. The, the best staging we ever had, unfortunately, and David was very organized, but not in this one tour, the Diamond Dogs tour, we did not capture and that was take two or three days to set up that. That was like a Broadway show. You'll see clips here and there, but we never got, I'm hoping someday someone was in there with some proper cameras, but it was the only one. I was all about being his piano player. So I had nothing to do with that. They dressed me up nicely and it was fine. And, and uh, we all looked great, but he had such a vision. Each tour different look, the Ziggy look, as you know. And the last few tours between 19, I think, 92, maybe in 2004, I must have done about six or eight tours or more in that period, shorter ones, longer ones. He was just himself. There was no, he wasn't being a character, which was very interesting. But he had to be a character in 72 because he was had stage fright. So if he could become Ziggy, he was okay. 
Yeah, I've heard that a lot about um, artists who, you know, even really, really well-known artists, and I, and I think that's a, it's a great illustration of it there, Mike, who by inhibiting a character or inhabiting a character, they actually, uh, it just allows them to be someone else and, and really take off in front of an audience. So that, that sounds like it was a very similar situation with Bowie. So, um, Mike, you've been involved in a, in a number of, of, of tributes, and, you know, these days, tribute bands are a real phenomenon around the world. There's, there's uh, and David Bowie touched the touch the the lives of so many people and there's amazing tribute acts in in the uk and the us and even here in australia my hometown has a, a band called ashes to ashes who are a wonderful bowie tribute they, they sound fantastic but you've been involved in uh many concerts and events celebrating bowie's life and his music since his passing and I, i'm i'm really interested in um the idea of what's it like for you to honor his legacy in this way how does that how does that make you feel well, you know, in all the years that I was playing with him, people would call to do a tribute band. And I'm saying, why would I do that? I'm playing with the real guy. Why would I want to play with someone who's like karaoke on steroids or whatever, you know? So so uh, I have turned them all down for many years. And some were talented and good. It just wasn't David. But when he passed, it seemed almost natural. So I had a Bowie alumni group with many people who had played with him and they were in my band. And over a period of, uh, up until COVID for about four years, um, I must've done a couple of hundred concerts around the world. Uh, we had amazing singers. Sting did a show with us. Uh, Joe Elliott, you know, from Def Leppard and Simon from Duran Duran. Lord did Life on Mars with us. Um, Boy George did some stuff with me. Uh, Adam Lampert, Ian Hunter. I did streaming when I couldn't tour during COVID. So I have, I'm sitting with like 60 videos of fantastic artists doing his music. Sometimes I would arrange it with strings and orchestra or band, and we're doing all from our places. But we did a lot of touring, and we played at the Sydney Opera House, uh, within a, a year of his passing, I was there, and uh, they were great. You know, I had, uh, I would always have about three singers. So it was taxing. We'd be doing five shows a week. It's just too much for, for one voice, you know. And it was nice to have the variations. We had Gail Ann Dorsey in the early days, and who was our bass player, and she did backups with David for many years. So... Um, it was something that came about organically. Gary Oldman, the actor, he did a bunch of shows with me. Evan Rachel Wood, the actress from Westworld, she loves David. And and she grew up with the leprechaun stuff and all all, all that stuff from his movies. And, and uh, so I've met a lot of beautiful people who adore him. We had Trent Reznor did fashion with me and we did, uh, uh, we haven't put these things out yet, but he did that on Fantastic Voyage, just me and him and Atticus. So we're sitting with this gold mine of stuff that eventually hope to come out on vinyl and maybe it'll even be like a Netflix special. We'll see, you know. But um, so it just seemed very natural just because um I'm alive. Just like when you said it's 50 years, who would assume an artist would be able to get the benefit of what he did 50 years ago? It doesn't usually work that way and certainly didn't for David or Mick Ronson uh, or Trevor. They all passed and no less so Dennis Davis, the drummer who played with us back in the day and toured with us during Young American. And Luther is gone. Luther Vandro. So I feel you know, blessed that I'm still here to tell the story and still making music and more excited about playing than ever. Because if you could last that long, you know, some bits of wisdom slip through and then you start to use that in your music, you know. Yeah. 
No, great point. And, uh, G- great point, Mike. And I, uh, you've alluded to the fact that over that 50 years, there's been some amazing, amazing collaborations. And we're going to talk about some of your more direct collaborations um, after Bowie in, in a little while. But just a, a, as we're about to wrap up sort of the David Bowie years, what are some of the most impactful collaborations? It sounds like Mick Ronson was obviously one of them, but what were the, the really impactful collaborations over that time? Well, uh, the one with Mick with the Spiders was a fantastic one on Ziggy, the album, and Hunky Dory, just fantastic. Then there was the collaborations on Young Americans with me and David and Luther Vandross and Dave Sanborn and Carlos Alomar on guitar, who had worked with James Brown, and his groove on the guitar was unlike anyone, you know? And then... uh, you know, you could skip to Blackstar with Donnie McClasson on saxophone and, and the band he put together. And just, uh, it's a requiem, you know. David's the only artist who wrote his own requiem, you know what I mean? So, so, so uh, those were great collaborations. Um, I had a lot of duet collaborations with him. We'd be on tour and said, let's slide down. So the place called the Manhattan Center, and there's a thing. Paul Simon's there, and they're 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 um, making money for X charity, and we're going to do My Death, which is a Jacques Brel tune, and we're going to do Small Plot of Land, which is as avant garde as anything he ever did, and it's going to be without drums and bass and guitar, just you and me. And then we do Yahoo events because uh, he got awards for being way ahead of his time with the computer back in 2000. So we did Wild as the Wind. You could see that one on YouTube with just me and him. It's, it's, it's spectacular. There's probably an album's worth of stuff that was just me and him. And uh, a lot of it's been released over the last few years. They, they've culled some of these magic moments. I saw them, the Warner Brothers sent me a bunch of the records and but it was just nice to hear after all these years. That's amazing. Yeah, I can imagine. And I'm sure there are many fans out there that would love to see as much released as possible. Um, it, Mike, your David Bowie's music and your collaboration with him has inspired, obviously, countless musicians uh, and artists over the years. Um, so this is our final question in this phase, and it's hard to quantify, but how does it feel to have been part of such a seminal and influential body of work across, essentially, a, the worldwide popular culture? It's still hitting me. I haven't actually got it yet. I'll tell you why. If it was Bill Evans or Coltrane or Miles, I would have got it the second I played because those were my heroes. I didn't know any of his music. So the people who were adoring him and jumping on the limo and cutting pieces of his hair off and attacking us on stage. You know, the first show I played, I had music, so I had the charts in front of me. The encore is done. The band takes off the backstage through a tunnel, and I'm wrapping up my music, and all of a sudden 5,000 people are charging me, and I said, holy shit, and I had to grab the music and run. So it was another way of things, but he wasn't the person that I grew up with. I grew up with Vladimir Horowitz as a concert pianist, Arthur Rubinstein. I grew up listening to Beethoven sonatas, Chopin, and certainly R. Tatum, but Powell, Wheaton Kelly, Bill Evans, all those kind of people. I was fortunate to study. I had a lesson, six-hour free lesson with Bill Evans, three lessons with Herbie Hancock, uh, three years with Lenny Tristano, who was blind and he had played with Charlie Parker. So, I mean, my life has been extremely blessed that way. But I I haven't fully seen the impact because every day that I meet another actor or actress or singer, they tell me what David did to their life. This has now happened with about 250 very famous people. And because he was in my soundtrack of my life, I see it from a different place. When you're 15 or 16 and you fall in love with Bob Dylan or the Rolling Stones or you 2 or whoever that is, or Bowie, it changed your life. So what I was listening to, I was listening to Errol Garner and Brubeck and Keith Jarrett and Coltrane and McCoy Tyner. If these were the people I was working with 
I'd be in a whole other headspace. And I could answer that question from day one. It's unbelievable. I'm still figuring out why they liked him and me, which is hilariously stupid, but the truth. So it feels to me like, Paul, we didn't talk this interview up too much by any means. Um, that, that was the end of part one and what a treat. Yeah, what an amazing insight into working with, I don't know how to describe David Bowie really, just one of the most iconic pop culture figures of the 20th century and beyond. So yeah, we learned so much there, didn't we? Absolutely. And I mean, I, I still have to pinch myself at times. I, as a high school student, I know I'm, I'm showing my age, but back in the days where you'd wear badges, so you'd wear little badges. And the very first one I remember buying was a David Bowie badge. Oh, and is that I, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah and, and, and it was part, as much based on his look as his music. I, being a country boy, I didn't know that much of his music, except what had been played on the local radio station. But mm. yeah, iconic, as I said, at the, the introduction definitely applies to this episode. And, and what Mike talked about there was was just amazing. So we'll be back for part two uh, very, very soon. But just first, some shout outs, as always, to our wonderful supporters. So Brother Paul Brown from The Water Boys. I think I say it every episode, but do check out or follow Brother Paul's Facebook page at the very least. Some of the videos that he posts of um, people in the audience and uh, showing him at work, that, that guy, uh, if ever the words force of nature apply, it's to Brother Paul. So th thank you, Brother Paul. Um, Tammy Catcher, the wonderful Tammy Catcher from Tammy's Musical Stew. Uh, always appreciate her ongoing support. Um, yeah, can't thank you enough, Tammy. Uh, Radio Grande, funk, funk reimaginings of some great songs. They've had a bit of growth on their YouTube channel. Do check them out, R-A-D-I-O-G-R-A-N-D-E. Um, so Darren and the team there are brilliant. And last but definitely not least, Mike at Midnight Mastering. I know we have lots of musicians out there that compose their own music. If you want a nice independent person to mix and master your work for a very reasonable price, then definitely check out midnightmastering.com. Um, and second last but not least is the musicplayer.com forums. Um, our home of more than 20 years and, um, yeah, a, a very valued home. So, yeah, we look forward to um, seeing you back next episode. And in the meantime, have a good time.